Inner Princess Rani, or Rena when she's lying to you, is the literal waifu of Elden Ring, and I absolutely love her. I picked her ending, I cried when I killed Blythe, and I want her fucking hat. So today, I'm gonna show you how I made my cosplay of her, from her gross rope feet to her ever-coveted hat. And below you'll find timestamps for each piece of the cosplay, so you can skip to whatever section you need, or you could watch the whole thing because that drives watch time in. This channel isn't monetized yet. First, I'm gonna break down the pieces of this cosplay, and luckily for us, you can get her armor set in Elden Ring. So we need a dress, a robe, a cape, and the biggest hat I've ever seen. And I'm starting with the crown of the last princess of Caria, the Snow Witch hat. For fabric, we have a couple different things going on here. Originally, I was going to make the hat out of this polyester wool with this gray felt as mulling. So mulling is a layer of fleece, felt, or wool that goes in between the structural layer and the fashion layer. And what it does is it helps hide the structure and it makes the hat look a lot softer and smoother. So wool is kind of expensive and I did a, I did a dumb. I didn't buy swatches before I bought these. I just assumed that I would really like this wool and I would want it on the top. Turns out I actually like this fleece felt way better. So I've actually switched them. It does kind of seem like a waste to use the wool as mulling, and it is. However, in my eyes, it would have been more of a waste of money to then buy another three yards of fabric instead of just using something I already bought. For you, if you like the look of this, this is really cheap. This is $4 a yard. This would also make good mulling just by six yards of the fleece felt. For the structure, we have again, Pelion 71 and 72F. So this stuff is basically the same rigidity that you would get with 10 millimeter EVA foam with having the benefit of fitting through doors. Could you make this hat in EVA foam? Yes, but I don't think you want to if you're going for a 40 plus inch hat. The problem with this Pelion though, is it only comes in a 20 inch width. But that's not a huge deal because we can form our 40 inch circle with eight eighths of that circle. So imagine it's a pizza and we need to sew all of our slices back together to form our full 40 inch pizza. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna reinforce it with two rings of 16 gauge wire. One about halfway through the hat and one a little bit closer to the head hole. And I'm sewing these on by machine with a zigzag stitch, but if you don't want to break several needles, you can just do this by hand. Uh, if you do do this by machine, wear safety glasses. And damn, does this look like Celibus's hat and not Ronnie's. And spoiler alert, I end up making some changes that make it a lot less preceptor-esque. Anyway, but the 72F has adhesive on both the top and the bottom. The 71F only has adhesive on the bottom. So some of the hat doesn't have adhesive on the top. It has adhesive all around the bottom of the brim and in some places not on the top, but that'll, that'll be okay. You don't necessarily need adhesive on the top side because gravity is a thing, but you do want it on the bottom because again, gravity is a thing and you're not Radon. You're not making your hat stay up with your magic. Anyway, for the very bottom, I wasn't sure what to do about this at first. It wasn't until I got a really good look at what the hat pattern is that I realized it is a textured, grungy snowflake pattern. Where did I get this? I made this in Photoshop and I got this printed at Spoonflower. If you want this, it's on my Spoonflower shop. I only bought a yard of it in the petal signature cotton. So that's $17 for one layer of the hat. That's a little pricey. You could probably find something similar that you didn't have to get printed, but I based this on the design that's in the game. So it's about as accurate as I'm gonna be able to get it. But those are our fabrics, pattern under layer, mulling outside, structure, good. So here I have the layers of the brim of the hat. On the very top, we have our gray felt. Underneath that, we have a mulling layer, which in this case is the wool that I was going to use on the top. In the dead middle, we have the interfacing. Underneath that, we have another mulling layer. And on the very bottom, we have our patterned fabric. 
the first thing I need to do is make sure the pattern fabric and the bottom layer of the mulling are attached together. And what I'm gonna do is quilt them together while following the lines of the snowflakes. And because they're going with the lines of the snowflakes, those stitches are pretty well hidden. I don't go over every single snowflake, I'm just doing enough to keep them together. Now I'm gonna combine all of these layers together by activating the adhesive of the Pelion. What I'm doing is making a sandwich of my upper mulling layer, the inner facing with the wire side placed on the top, then the mulling layer with the quilted pattern fabric on the bottom, and I'm gonna press all of those together, which activates both sides of the glue, using a pressing cloth on the bottom to protect the snowflakes, and giving it a good press on the top too to make sure all of that glue is activated. So I have a problem. This is not the way her hat is supposed to be shaped. First thing is the wool I'm using for mulling is way too heavy, so the 16 gauge wire is not enough to keep it upright. The second thing is her hat is actually like a downward cone, and this pattern is a full circle. And the reason I did that, the reason I wanted to try to do it as a full circle is because a full circle doesn't need a seam. But now I need a seam, which also means I need to cut out a section of what I have already done. Will I regret this decision? I don't know, but we're doing it. So, RIP. So I messed with this quite a lot, and I ended up figuring out that I wanted to overlap it by the full breadth of one panel of the hat. So if we go back to our pizza, I took out an entire slice, which when put back together, creates a wide cone. So now the brim is a 7 8 pizza, and with a little finagling, I was able to whip stitch the interfacing back together, whip stitch a fold over on the underside, blind stitch that down, cut off the top excess mulling, and whip stitch that down into place. And now I had a nice, well-structured 7 8 pizza cone instead of the floppy pizza brim I had before. This is all we can do to the brim for now, so moving on to the inner cone. That's right, inner cone. The way this hat is structured is we have our brim, an inner cone, and then basically a cover that I sewed independently to itself before it was hand sewn onto the structure of the hat. This is mainly to help us create those bunchies, but it also helps hide the seams where the cone meets the brim. With most hats, you have to hand sew your cone in, but this way I was able to machine sew it, which makes the seam a lot less obtrusive. And the reason that's important to me is because Ronnie's hat has no seams. So the inner cone is basically two eighths pizza slices made of the Pelion 71F and fused to the fleece. I also left an inch overhang of the fleece from where it was fused, which makes it easier to sew onto the brim, which is what I did next. I used a curved needle and a whip stitch and I secured the inner cone to the very center of the brim. And you don't wanna go all the way through to the other side. You really just wanna sew this through the mulling layer. And now that the inner cone is attached, we can make that cover. This piece is made up of an outer cone, which is a very large, very curved shape. The top side of the brim, which is a full circle, and the binding going on the outside of the underside of the brim. The binding, by the way, is not cut on the bias. It is cut as a ring because we are not attaching it like binding. Because again, this hat has no seams. So to make that ring, I cut another full circle the same size as the top side and cut inward like four or five inches. To simplify that, think of the top side of the brim as basically a full circle skirt. And we're going to sew it to the curve of the bottom of the cone. Then we're going to sew the ring binding to the hem of the brim. And when all of that's together, we can sew up the side of the cone piece and if you want to, you can sew up the brim piece too, but you'll see why I left that open in a minute. Remember, I was figuring this out as I went, so I wasn't sure about everything. Anyway, there's one more exciting trick I had for this hat to hide the seams, and that comes in the form of sandpaper. To put it very simply, 
I sand at all the seams. Because this fleece has a lot of fiber to it, it doesn't hide the seams entirely, but it definitely diminishes their appearance. And I thought this was a really cool trick. Anyway, at this point, the cover is ready, so put that sucker onto the brim. Okay, so to get all this slouchiness, what's going on here is this cone is bigger than the cone we have inside. It's also taller, right? And then this is the only part that has the stuffing in it. And remember I had that cone kind of pushed down and you can push it down even more if you need to, but because it's taller, when it gets stretched on top of it, it's gonna bunch up like this and give us all these pretty bunchies. To attach the bottom, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip the whole thing over which is difficult now. And our excess piece has this little bit of seam allowance and then of course our little fold over. What I'm gonna do first is sew this seam allowance by hand all the way around the brim, just the seam allowance. Then I'm gonna take this part, flip it over and hand sew that in two. The reason I'm doing that to the seam allowance, basically we wanna keep the seam allowance in the same place all the way around the hat. Because if you don't do that, you risk having some places where the seam allowance is on top and some places where the seam allowance is on bottom, and that might not look super good. So I'm going to go through the entire thing and sew all that down. Also, the back here, remember, we lost part of our pizza, so there is still excess pizza on the back here, and these overlap. I want to be able to make sure that I can properly attach this to the brim so I don't want to cut this yet. And I'm probably going to end up folding it like we did the underside and sewing it in by hand too. And that might mean that this seam is a little more obtrusive, but I'm okay with that. It's on the back side of the hat. The rest of the seams are like almost invisible. And if that's the sacrifice we have to make to make sure everything else looks good, then I'm fine with that. But for now, we're back to hand sewing. So to finish this, so we have this part here that's already all sewn down. We have this, and all I'm doing is I take this part and I fold it under. Make sure it's not like folding weird or anything. I'm also making sure I cover this, and I'm doing what's called a blind stitch. So I'm gonna go, I'm already in the hat, using the curved needle again. Go into the felt, just that first layer. You don't wanna go on the top, you just want this little folded over edge. And I'm coming out, and I'm going into the hat, like pretty much parallel to where I just was. Eh. Ow. Christ, that won't come out. Ow. Okay, and pull that down. I'll do that again, because that was such a shit show. Into this part, out of that part, out, parallel, into the hat, out of the hat, out. And it folds that over. And yes, this does hurt my hands. Yes, I have blisters, but it's okay. We're almost done. This is basically the last step of this part of the hat, and then I just have to do the crown. Maybe I'll get even more blisters. Who knows? So this crown, I have obviously already started working on it, but I'm gonna tell you what I already did. Did I make two of these? Yes. The first one came out pretty bad. Uh, the first one I did in a little bit of wire, tin foil, to try to do the loops and stuff and then I covered all of it in foam clay and it was just too big too bulky and it didn't look enough like Ronnie's crown so then what I did was I went through and I made myself a guide based on a photo of her to get a better visual of what these loops need to look like so it could be at least a little bit accurate. Printed that out and then started bending wire into that shape. You obviously can't make the entire thing out of one single piece of wire. So what I did to attach them was loop masking tape around wherever they needed to meet. And this is only going to be a temporary hold. So then once I had the long flat version of it, I looped the whole thing into a circle, secured it with masking tape. And now I'm gonna get into what I'm covering this with. So firstly, I'm reinforcing all of the tape places with warbler scraps. Now, we're only using it for its strength though, so don't feel like you have to use warbler. I just happen to have a jar, a jar of warbler scraps. So I'm using what I have. Then everywhere else, I'm coating all of the wire in the tiniest little bit of the foam clay. Foam clay 
isn't like the miracle worker that I think some people make it out to be. It can be pretty hard to work with and getting it to look like a singular tube on top of wire is not easy, but like everything on Ronnie, this crown looks fairly organic, so I wouldn't beat yourself up too much if you can't get it looking perfectly smooth. I have about half of that done. It's a long, annoying process to cover wire and foam clay, but I'm gonna keep doing that. And when it's done, I'm going to prime it, paint it, and basically just hand sew it onto the hat. The crown is just sewn on by hand with some very thick denim thread, not all the way around either, just in a few places where it's touching the hat. And for final details, this is unconventional, but I'm using the setting powder I have for my body paint to add a white cast to the edges of the brim. Will this wear off over time? Yes, <laughs> but it does look pretty good. Uh, no, you don't need to use Mehron powder. Uh, you could probably use baby powder or even use a pigment that's more permanent. Uh, but if you do use baby powder, your hat's gonna smell like baby powder. So I would keep that in mind. Anyway, I put that all the way around the brim and then some around the bunchies on the top of the hat. And then I went in again with eyeshadow into the folds of the hat. Oh, and by the way, I never filmed this, but all of those bunchies are sewn into place. The reason you didn't see me film it is because I had to awkwardly stick my entire arm into the cone and basically sew above and below each of the bunchies to hold them in place. Oh, and the tip, that is also tacked down as well. So none of this is going anywhere and I won't have to adjust it ever. And that is the Snow Witch hat. And so now we can move on to the Snow Witch robes. So I decided to go with linen for the dress because Elden Ring's clothing style is slightly like medieval Middle Ages inspired. And I think because linen was what they used in the Middle Ages, I think the game devs purposely made this texture look like linen. But linen's kind of expensive, so I would recommend a nice cotton if you want to save some money. But there was a texture I was confused about, that being the one on her collar. So on Ronnie's dress, in the actual game, you can very clearly see that the top part of her yoke and the collar are some kind of ambiguous texture, but they are distinctly a different texture from the rest of her dress. And I wasn't sure what to do about that, but then I watched the trailer again. And in the trailer, you can see a little bit more clearly what that texture is. It's still about as ambiguous as the lore of the game, but you can kind of see that it's got like a little swoop pattern to it and most importantly it's got a little glint a little light which makes sense because she is wearing a snow witch's robe she does cold magic also did you know that elden ring has a frozen joke in it on blythe's armor set it says that after ronnie learned cold magic he got a cape because the cold bothered him anyway anyway so what i decided to do is use a decorative stitch on my sewing machine and some really cool thread that I found. These are two specialty threads that I picked up. Originally, I was just looking for like a silver metallic thread and I came across these specialty variegated threads. This one is straight up just iridescent. It's almost completely clear, just sorta has a glint to it. But then this little monster, is holographic silver thread. Between these two, I ran tests and they are both very pretty. This one only glints pink and green and like orange, whereas this one has this gorgeous rainbow of hollow. I can't let a hollow sexual down. So we're going with the hollow thread and I'm really excited because this is so cool. Anyway, I'm gonna do the swoopy pattern basically crisscross all across these pieces. So the pieces I have are both of the front yoke pieces and the top side of the collar. The other thing to note about threads like this is these are plastic. If you watch it, it's stretching as I pull it and then it'll snap. That can be a big problem, but you can still sew with them by machine. But there's basically two ways you can do it and they both involve winding a bobbin. The thing is, 
You can't use this with a regular bobbin because this is a totally different kind of tension than your bobbin is going to be. And you need the tension to be the same or everything's gonna get messed up. So the safest way is to have a bobbin full of this thread and your top thread in this thread. And they have the same tension so they get along. If you have a bobbin that is not this kind of thread and a top thread that is, they will not kiss, they don't like each other. So fuck regular bobbins today. With our regular bobbins thrown away and collar and yoke pieces done with their detailing, we can move on to the rest of the bodice. Most of the bodice goes together really simply. Just sew together the back seam, the back side seams, and the front side seams. But the front bottom panels need some attention before we can sew them in. So first things first, I have some prep work to do with the fronts before they can even be attached to the whole thing. In the game, she just has a seam in the front, but in the trailer, she actually has a lacing strip going up the front. And I think that looks really cool, so I'm gonna do that. But I need to first give myself a nice little folded edge up here so that I can put eyelets on it. I don't know how I'm gonna do the eyelets yet, but I'll figure that out later. So I'm making myself a half inch line and then another half inch line. And now I'm gonna fold and press that. So I'm gonna start this with my hands because this is actually a heat erase pen. And so I need to pre-fold this before I put the iron on it because I'm gonna lose both marks as soon as I iron it. But finger pressing is actually like a super important part of sewing. One of the downsides to linen is that it wrinkles like a bitch. That also means it presses like an angel. Now off to the iron. All right, so now I have both of the front pieces and I'm gonna run a straight stitch right here. Also, the yoke needs that little fold over too. With the fronts closed, we still need to take our bottom center fronts and gather them down to the size of the yoke. So first, I do a gathering stitch, which is just a straight stitch set to the longest stitch length, so it's really loose. And then I just pull the bobbin thread to make it gather up. With that gathered down, now we can sew each of those onto the yoke pieces. And after all of that prep work, we finally have our front panels. Now we can finish up the bodice. So those get sewn onto the side front seams and then the shoulders get sewn up. Now we can make the collar. So we're gonna take our detailed piece, which is the top side, and I'm lining it with the linen with a lightweight fusible interfacing on it. You definitely wanna add the interfacing though because linen on its own is just a little too light for a collar. But all we do now is sew those together around the outside. And I'm trimming the edges with pinking shears but you can cut notches if you don't have these, but you want something because that's gonna help the curve. Well, it's gonna help the curve curve. And then I'm clipping my corners cause that's gonna help the corners be pointy, turning all that inside out and pressing it flat. So there's a bit of a time jump here. Uh, it's actually a week before Momocon now. This is not the collar you saw me make because I remade it. The first one was just a little too small and the pattern I did just didn't quite work. So I remade it. This one's bigger. Also, you'll notice I've put a zipper in. I was originally just going to lace up the front, but then I signed myself up for an 8 a.m. shoot. So I gave her a zipper so I can do this at 8 a.m. quickly. Anyway, this collar obviously is now in two different pieces. And the way I'm gonna sew this on is we're gonna have our collar and we're also gonna use a little piece of bias tape. And these are flat collars. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it up to there, to the neckline, and I'm gonna take my little piece of bias tape, I'll fold it right there at the edge, and I'm gonna put it right here. Everything's lined up nice. I'm gonna pin this whole thing up to the neckline with the bias tape on top of it. These, by the way, are the buckles for the cape. And these are the buckles for the arms. They're just in the armpit. I'm gonna be real honest. I didn't think this would go all the way across the neckline. Let's so win for me. It's the bias, what the fuck? The bias tape is too short. No! God damn it. Okay, so now that this is pinned, I'm gonna do a straight stitch right here through the bias tape, the collar, and the bodice. So now, I'm gonna take my bias tape, I'm gonna fold it over once, fold it over again, and folding it to the other side. See? So now, we're gonna flip our collar up, 
we're gonna get that nice and flat and pin it. So again, I'm gonna fold the bias tape, fold it over to the other side, get that collar out of the way, and pin that. So now we're gonna make sure this collar stays up and we're gonna run a straight stitch with this splayed open and stitch it right through here to keep that bias tape down. And that is miles better than the collar I had first. Uh, by the way, you might notice this is a different fabric. This is just micro suede. I ran out of linen a long time ago, so I don't think it looks that much different. It's all white. Yeah. There's our collar. The last thing I did to the bodice was add machine eyelets. And this is only necessary if you want that lace-up look from the trailer. But my machine has one-step eyelets, so I just have to set the machine to the eyelet stitch, make sure it's on the correct foot, and let it go. I also have a little bit of tearaway stabilizer to help keep it stable. And um, I, don't, I don't know if I just don't like the eyelets my machine does, or if I did them sloppy, but I don't really like these, and they look better than if I had done like regular grommets, but I don't think I'm going to be doing eyelets again. Anyway, I need to mention, in that little fold over section, I added a bone. It's just a little piece of the synthetic whale bone and it just helps keep the fronts from buckling to those laces. So the bottom of the dress is actually visible by just wearing the legs item of her set, but that's real overcomplicated for something you literally can't see. And if you look at Ronnie's model, there's actually just two white pieces hanging there by themselves that aren't even a full skirt. So I'm gonna go with the middle ground and do two skirts, one long, one short on top of each other. Both the long and short skirts are just made of four trapezoid shaped pieces. So I didn't even make a pattern for these. I just measured them and cut them out. Both these skirts are sewn together at the back and side seams, but not at the front. We're leaving that open and I'm finishing that with a double fold seam, just like we did on the center fronts earlier. But here they both are, the long boy and the short cape. Also notice that after sewing the short one together, I folded the skirt in half and cut the top edge on a curve going downward towards the front. That's what's gonna get us that little overhang effect. Now we're gonna put both of these skirts onto the bodice with the long skirt being first. So I line that up at the back of the bodice and I'm only taking that up to the join of the side front seams because this one isn't really closed all the way. And I also gave it a couple pleats at the front to make it look a little more flowy. Once that was basted on, we can move on to the short king. This one got lined up at the back again, and I'm taking this all the way up to the center front. And this is getting a few pleats as well. And with one more straight stitch, we have our two skirts attached. And now I'm gonna hem them. You actually wanna hem them after you get them attached to the bodice because you wanna make sure they're the right length and that they are level. The short one, I'm just doing a double fold hem again, but the long one, I'm gonna hem with horsehair braid. Horsehair braid is a really stiff net that gives a lot of body to hemlines. It comes in a lot of width and the wider the width, the more body it gives. So I'm using a half inch braid for this for just a little bit of body and flow to the bottom of the skirt. Hemming with this also comes out really clean, even if you're a baby sewist. Basically, you sew it to the right side of the entire hem, then you do this sort of maneuver. You're basically folding it over and using the stiffness of the braid to push the raw edges into a fold. Then all you have to do is do a straight stitch on that fold. And if you're using a wider width, you might also want to do another stitch at the very top of the braid. But that's it. It's really easy to install and almost always worth it. But that's the dress. And I'll, oh, I'll also add that the sleeve holes are just bound in bias tape. You could totally do sleeves, but that will add a little bit of bulk under the robe. Now for the robes fabric, it is distinctively different than the texture of the dress. And I found this gorgeous double gauze that has a very nice weight to it, while also having this amazing texture that looks almost dead on to Ronnie's. So I pulled this pattern from this person's website. They have a free scalable robe pattern meant for a series I won't name, but all I did was scale it up and remove the hood. So if you want my version, that's also free on my Patreon, or you could just use this one.
I thought this robe was going to be the easiest part of this build, but it ended up being the biggest pain. Literally, it gave me literal physical pain. I had to stand up and sit down so many times to get these giant pieces cut out. I felt this in my legs for days. So this robe is just four very large pieces that go together pretty easily. I surged all of them first, and then it's just a mile long back seam, a half mile long side seam, the shoulders, and installing the sleeves. And if you don't know how to install a sleeve, I have explanations in these two videos. For the hem, you can see that the robe has a slightly different texture at the bottom. And originally I was just going to use the double gauze, but I again did a dumb. I miscalculated and I ran out of the double gauze. So I settled for this short pile fur that I had just enough of in my stash. It might not be the exact texture you can see in Elden Ring, but it's certainly a different texture. And seeing as these are Snow Witch robes, I feel like it fits okay. But I had so little of it, this gave me some trouble. I had to cut it on the straight grain instead of the bias. And because of that, there's a couple places where the fold over isn't that pretty. But to attach it, I just sewed it right sides together with the full length of the hem and then flipped and folded it over and hand sewed the edge on the other side. Basically this collar is two really long pieces that go all the way down the front seams and the neckline. I cut two of them and then I sewed them together around the outside and then I understitched the inside seam allowance to keep it folded neatly and I ran out of thread while I was doing this and this was the day I was sitting there trying to grind out soloing Melania and this made me so mad. Anyway, this collar goes on the same way we did the shirt collar with bias tape, so I'm not gonna re-explain that. And the waistband is a rectangle of fabric, so I'll give you another break and not over-explain that either. But with that, the robe is done, and we can move on to that cape. So I'm gonna call this the stole, her little fur cape wrap thing. I specifically made the pattern so that it would fit on one yard of fur fabric because fur is really expensive. And uh, you may have noticed this fur is white. That's because this is the longest pile fur I could find for the best price. This was like $18 a yard and that's really steep, but if you're only buying one yard, it's not so bad. The problem was they did not have any gray in stock. So I'm not actually dyeing this, I'm painting it. The other reason I'm painting it is because her little fur stole looks really gross and the paint also serves to like stiffen it and tangle it and sort of mat it and that's how I'm gonna get that like gross realistic fur texture but that also means I have to paint the entire thing and if you don't want to do that just buy some gray fur and when I say it's long pile it is it is a four inch pile I definitely would not suggest just going to Joann's and buying whatever they have on the rack because the stuff at Joann's is really expensive. I think it's like $20, $30 a yard. I started painting this already and then I realized I probably want to just cut my pieces out. So I'm going to do that. The thing about fur is when you cut it, you really only want to cut the backing. You don't want to cut through the pile. It just makes it easier to cut that way and it saves you from all the mess. This goes together really easily. You just need to sew each side piece right sides together with the back piece. Sewing fur together isn't really any different from any other kind of fabric, but it is bulky, so a walking foot will help you. A walking foot is the foot you usually see me use. It basically has an entire set of feed dogs on the top side, and that combined with your machine's feed dogs on the bottom helps a lot with getting bulky or even sticky fabrics through your machine evenly. Now, I spent several weeks, a little at a time, painting the entire thing. This sucked. This was a bad idea. I don't recommend you do this. Just buy some gray fur and don't be like me. But uh, yeah, I just used acrylic paint and a big fan brush and it... Anyway, this is optional, but I also added a black lining that's just flat lined in. What I don't suggest to be optional is adding some straps with parachute buckles to the inside of the cape. 
so you can buckle it to your dress and not have to worry about it falling off. Finally, to finish it off, I have a strip of brown short pile fur cut on the bias to form the whatever this is, and I'm cutting a bunch of strips of canvas to be the bands. So I'm not finishing these and there's fraying everywhere and I don't mind this for Ronnie, but if you're looking for a more professional look or if you're competing in this, you probably wanna make finished strips instead. Anyway, I just basted those strips onto both sides of my strip of fur and then I took acrylic paint again and weathered the hell out of all the strips and the fur. When all that was done, I attached it to the cape the same way you do any bias binding sewing it right sides together, flipping and folding it over, and sewing the back side on by hand with a whip stitch. Also, I stuffed this whole thing with scraps from the hat. And that's the cape. So these are made of cardboard, 16 gauge wire, foam clay, and seamless gloves. They are poseable, lightweight, and they look just as gross as Ronnie's. So starting off, I have a piece of cardboard that I traced my hand onto, and it's also trimmed a little bit because the foam is gonna add a little bit of bulk. Then to give it structure, I bent wire into this shape with a loop at the bottom that's gonna become an attachment and two loops near the wrist, which will also become an attachment. Then I stuck it through the other side, bent it for stability, and secured it down with masking tape. Then I reinforced all the fingers with wire, which I did by making a little loop, bending the loop 90 degrees and jamming that through the fingertips, bending it like we did before and taping it down. Once I have wire in all of the fingers, it's time for the foam clay. Foam clay, EVA clay, or cosplay clay is like a foam putty version of the EVA foam most cosplayers are familiar with. If you haven't used it, I would compare it to Model Magic, but this stuff makes Model Magic look like garbage. It's softer, it's a lot easier to shape, and it self-levels itself to some degree. It's definitely not a miracle worker, but it is pretty sick. Anyway, it doesn't really stick to things, but it sticks to itself really well. So to help it stick to the cardboard, I went through and punched holes along all the fingers so that it'll stick to itself from the other side. To start with the clay, I roll out a little snake and I push it flat onto the palm side of the finger, trying my best to shape it into, well, the shape of the underside of a finger. Then I push the excess around the sides, pushing it into the open cardboard to help it stick even more. And then I roll another snake and push it onto the top side and start to form the top of a finger. I'm not trying to get these super perfect because remember, I'm gonna be putting gloves on these. So especially the seams of the foam, do not matter. Also, it's good to only do one or two fingers at a time because you really don't wanna bend them until that foam is fully cured or you risk messing up any shaping. But once the fingers are done, I start beefing up the rest of the hand. I start by gluing a piece of EVA foam to the back of the hand and two pieces around the wrist. And then I went in and filled all the edges with more clay. And then I also beefed out the sides and the fingers a little bit. For the palm, I need a big mass around the thumb and a big mass around the side of the hand, and then I need the center to be a little flatter. When all of that was dry, I painted the whole thing. And spoiler, I ended up painting this again because the cheap gloves I used to cover these were not the same color as the gloves I bought for my hands, so these got painted post having gloves on them. Anyway, I've been working on the left hand so far, but for this part, I'm switching to the right hand. On Ronnie's right side, her hands are open to expose the ropes inside of her. And what I'm gonna be doing with this is first wrapping the entire wrist wall to wall with rope. And then I'm taking a bunch of random pieces and gluing them in random places to sort of make it look like that wrist opening thing. But the other wrist just got painted like the rest of the hand. And now we can move on to those gloves. Or skin, really. These are really thin, really cheap gloves compared to the ones I'm wearing on my actual hands. But I struggle bust these on to cover the seams of the foam clay. Then, to keep them on forever, I mixed up tacky glue and water and painted that mixture onto the gloves. The left hand, the glove got glued all the way down, but on the right hand, I wrapped wire right where the rope starts so I could cut off the wrist of the glove just below the wire. Oh, and then I used hot glue to glue fake nails onto each finger and gave them all a little manicure. Okay, so the attachment here is pretty simple. 
We have a piece of bias tape going through this loop. It's sewn to itself. A parachute buckle and then a little bit of wide elastic and this little bit here is gonna go in the armpit of the dress and that's it. So this is, this will forever be in the dress and this is detachable. <clears throat> so the dress can still be washed. There's two attachments though, okay? We want one at the end of the arm and one right here at the wrist so that when it's on my wrist, it you know stays with it. All this is, this is a piece of fishing line and I didn't even use a needle. It was a little annoying to do, but I poked it through, made sure it was going through my little loops I made, poked it out the other side, and now I have taped it together. This is the right hand, and her upper right hand also has the rope stuff on it. So what I've done now to finish this attachment and also to make the upper rope portion, I just made a little, just a little square of fabric with Velcro on either side. It goes on like that. And now what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take this part and I'm gonna take my little tape piece and I'm gonna put this on here flat and I'm gonna go to my machine and I'm gonna zigzag stitch this on there. Now, I'm going to cover this little band in more of the rope. So on top of the zigzag stitching, there will be hot glue. If you just wanna hot glue this on, I won't blame you, but I'm gonna take the extra security step and sew this on. Well, that's a yikes. Uh, if you ever have this happen to you, this is actually called ratting, and what it is is a tension problem, uh, which makes sense because we're doing something that the machine really doesn't want us to do. Uh, the problem with ratting is it's not super secure, uh, so you do want to cut it off and try again. And the, honestly, the best fix for ratting, even when you're working with something weird like this, is to rethread your machine, and I'm going to see if I'm able to get away with just rethreading the bobbin. I'm going to try again. Yeah, we were good that time. So now, I just put it on like that. And it hangs. But now that I have this done, I'm going to cover this in rope and hot glue. And it'll look like a little crack in my arm. So now that we've got our extra hands, we need our hands to be blue too. Back in the day, we used to make these awful things called arm socks. That is these. These monstrosities are a pair of pantyhose with a neck hole cut out in the crotch. Then what was done, what I did to these, was you stick a hand-shaped piece of cardboard inside there and you would sew the fingers in. The problem with these is the process to make them was literally the most frustrating experience of my entire life. The, the thing about pantyhose is they are woven. They are not a material that wants to be in your sewing machine and they are not a material that is easy to sew in. But you know, they looked decent. The other problem is they tend to, they tend to break. Luckily for us now, We Love Colors, a tights company, they saw us doing this shit and they came out with seamless gloves that go up to your shoulder. Ugh. This isn't sponsored, by the way. I just love the fact that they literally saw cosplayers torturing themselves with pantyhose and were like, nah, bitch, we'll make you gloves that don't have any seams and match the colors of our tights. Uh, they are a little expensive. These are like $37 for a pair. That sounds like way too much for gloves, but considering the other route you might want to go, I will pay $37. The problem with these though, is we do need a little, we do need to do a little work to them. Cause when you put them on your hand, they still look like a glove. So I'm gonna do a couple things to this to make it look more like a hand and less like a glove. And then I'm also gonna do a couple things to make it look like Ronnie's hand. The first involves some eyeshadow. I'm literally just gonna take a blue eyeshadow and shade all over this hand. I'm gonna do around the fingers, on my knuckles, anywhere on the hand that usually is shadowed because that's gonna help give it a lot more depth. The other thing I'm gonna do is add nails. 
the nails are the big thing that makes it look like a hand because your hand usually has fingernails, including Ronnie. Uh, so I have some fingy nails ready and you do want to glue them while they're on your hand and you don't want to use hot glue. Don't use hot glue. Uh, super glue works pretty good. Um, I don't have any super glue. So I'm not gonna use hot glue, but I'm not gonna tell you how I glued them on. So you can see how much more natural this one looks compared to this one with just the nails and the little bit of shadowing on it. The thing about her left arm is she just has some cracks at the wrist. So this currently is just some acrylic paint. And I'm gonna do the same thing to this one, but because this arm is supposed to be like completely detached with the ropes, I actually need to have the bracelet on my arm and I'm gonna do that detail painting with the bracelet on my arm so that it sort of hopefully make it look like it's that gross inner rope structure that she has. The important thing about the paint though is you do need to have these on your arms when you do it because acrylic paint has a little bit of stretch to it. So you're okay to just use acrylic paint on this. However, if you do it when it's not on your arm, it's gonna stretch out and look bad. Same applies for the tights and it's actually exactly what I'm gonna do for the tights. I'm gonna put them on and I'm gonna paint all the cracks and weathering and stuff on them. Also the left hand's attachment is just a hook, like a hook from a hook and eye. And I just put the fishing line in that hook to put it on. For Ronnie's gross rope feet, I'm making some gross rope shoe covers. I'm starting off with some booties and I'm covering them with masking tape, but we aren't using this masking tape as a pattern. This is just to protect the shoe. Cause what I'm doing is pinning rope across the shoe, abutting more rope next to it, and hot gluing the rope to itself, not the shoe. Now, again, if you plan on this being something you wanna compete in, or if you just wanna have more strength, you probably wanna do all this in hand sewing, but hot glue's obviously a lot faster. But yeah, I'm just covering the entire shoe like this, looping around where I need to, starting new pieces where I need to, and I'm just gluing and gluing until the whole thing is covered. The only thing to watch out for is, you'll see I have a mark on the side where the zipper is. When I get to that line, I'm looping the rope back around so that that area isn't actually glued to itself and I have a gap for my zipper. When it's done, I carefully remove it from the tape, take the tape off the shoe, put that back on the shoe, and to finish it, I sewed a hook and bar onto the side for a closure, and then I reinforced a couple places around those hooks and bars with hand stitches just to make sure that hot glue doesn't break. And of course, I weathered them the same way I did the hands with black acrylic paint. And I had some gross rope shoes. What are those? And with that, Ronnie was ready for Momocon. I had a really good time in this cosplay. I found another Ronnie, I found a Melina, I found my dad, and I could fit through doors. The hands were super fun to play with, and the hat in the crowd wasn't too bad. It sort of served as a people buffer. And I had huge pockets, so I had everything I needed hidden away. The only thing that didn't fit in my pockets was my very last minute prop made of a slaughtered wig head and foam clay. And I'm sorry I didn't film how to make old America's head, but I just really wanted to do this. Oh, no. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching. I hope this helps you make your own Ronnie cosplay though. Technically, this is a cosplay of Rena because that's not Ronnie's real body, and her doll body is modeled after her teacher, whose name was possibly Rena. We don't know that for sure. Anyway, if you use any part of this, I would love to see it, so please send me a message on Instagram. And if you use the patterns, just remember it's a free pattern and I am sorry if it sucks. If you watched this entire long ass video, thank you. I hoped you liked it. And if you did, please give it a like and a comment and maybe a subscribe because those are the things YouTube tells me I'm supposed to tell you. And a big thank you to my big support tier patrons, Pins, Snip, and Claire. And thank you to Joe and Pins for helping me get footage at the con. And remember, Mama said, weave thy night into being. Bye. Yeah.